Lord, uh, we just want to humble ourselves before you and put you on the throne because I know I can't speak for anyone else, Lord, but for myself, sometimes I put myself, my wants and my wishes and desires before you. So, Father, I just ask on behalf of myself and my brothers and sisters in Christ that you'd forgive us, Lord, of our sins. You would humble our hearts that we may fully praise your name. We love you, Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. So, we're coming on the Christmas season. And if you go to the Gospel of Luke, the Gospel of Luke talks about specifically two different births. Whose births are those? John. John the Baptist Jesus. and Jesus. They are tied together. Why? Because John came before Jesus for a specific purpose and a reason. To go out and declare, make straight the path of the Lord. He was there to get everybody ready. In many respects, it's kind of like, I'm not sure if you've ever been to a concert where someone's opened up for someone bigger. But I remember when I was in my 20s, mom took me to a concert and it wasn't in their heyday, so it's, I'm not that old. But I saw Kiss open up for Aerosmith. And that was a pretty cool show. You know, there's always somebody that gets you ready for the next person. And to bring it to more contemporary terms, that was John's job. He was there to get everybody ready for the main event. And so today we're looking at John's response to Jesus' popularity over his own. And when we're studying the Bible, something I think I'd like, if everybody could learn to study the Bible in this way, it would help them out. First thing many of us do in the modern era is we take the Bible and we immediately apply it to ourselves. That's the wrong way to read the Bible. The best way we can read the Bible is look at who it was written to, and we've talked about that, and look at the time in which it was written. This wasn't written directly to us. It's for us, but it wasn't written to us. And so when we look at certain verses, it's easy to snatch verses out of context if we don't look at the Bible right. So there's the key to it all, context. So let's look at this situation here. Jesus had just uh, come on the scene. He had turned water into wine, right? He called disciples to himself. He declared God's purpose and plan for the Messiah to Nicodemus at that nighttime meeting. And now Jesus and his disciples are baptized. Well, at the very least, Jesus' disciples are baptized. So let's kind of take a look at what happens when John's popularity starts to decline. Verse 22. After this, meaning after that meeting that John had with Nicodemus, Jesus and his disciples went into the Judean countryside where he spent time with them and baptized. John was also baptizing in Aenon near Salem because there was plenty of water there. People were, count, or were coming and being baptized since John had not yet been thrown into prison. There's the context. John and Jesus are both doing what? Baptizing. They're baptizing. But John's baptism and Jesus' baptism were not the same baptism. John's baptism was not the same baptism as Jesus' baptism. What was John's baptism about? He talked about it. It was a baptism of what? Repentance. Repentance. Now, in the same vein, Jesus was doing the same thing. But you notice that after his ascension, Jesus' disciples, who were still faithful to him, didn't get baptized again. Now, I'm not saying to receive the Holy Spirit. Wait, say that again? Who's... You notice that no one in the upper room, did they get baptized after the ascension that we know of? Who baptized Jesus' disciples? He did. Or, or they may have been baptized John. Some of them were. We know at least J uh, James and Andrew. Now, it's kind of a, or John and Andrew. It's kind of a slippery slope. We don't really know this, but 
I'm going to say is, is we find out in the book of Acts that Apollos and at least 12 other guys only knew up to John, uh, John's baptism. Some people only stop at certain parts of the Bible. That's kind of the point that John is making here. That's all they, they only knew up to John's baptism. And John's disciples were very, they were very, very loyal to him. Even after he was dead, there were still people preaching what he preached. But Jesus' baptism was different. John's baptism was for the repentance. Jesus' baptism was for the kingdom. Does that make sense? Even before he was crucified? It was always... What was Jesus' constant message? The gospel of the kingdom. Jesus stayed true to his message from the very start. He didn't yeah. deviate from it. Yeah, but isn't, isn't it in a sense that baptism is a picture of Christ's death and resurrection? Yes, and, and, and I'm not, so, again, I'm not, I, I don't understand it, but it wasn't the same baptism. Because if it was, then the next thing wouldn't have happened. Listen to this. A dispute arose between John's disciples and a Jew about purification. So they came to John and told him, Rabbi, the one you testified about and who was with you across the Jordan is baptizing and everyone is flocking to him. What was the dispute about? John's baptism was repentance for purification. Jesus' baptism was different. They were going to Jesus for a different baptism. Where did it say that at? Verse 25. The reason the dispute arose because Jesus was teaching something more than what John was teaching. John was teaching repent for the kingdom of back, uh, the kingdom of heaven is near. One is coming who I'm not fit to tie his sandals. I baptize you with water, but he will what? Baptize you with the Holy Spirit. So does that mean that Jesus' baptism was different than John's? Otherwise, this dispute need not have come because what John is declaring here, if we miss it, remember how I was telling you all these little nuggets of things. If you skip over it, you miss it. John is declaring that Jesus' baptism was superior to John the Baptist's. Was there, is there any record of any more, I mean, a way of baptisms? In other words, did it? Greek did it or did I mean just for a it, it was a Jewish custom of purification. Now, before John? Even before John. Was it? Um, it was uh, a lot of it, some of it came down from the Maccabee area. Uh, what happened, and if you're, you know, Alan heard this uh, in Darwin's study in Sunday morning to talk about this, something that had happened during the Maccabean period, the Greeks took over Israel. And they basically were trying to stamp out anything having to do with God. They're trying to impose their way of life. And the Pharisees arose out of that conflict once the Maccabean Re uh, revolution was, was done. They were trying to draw people back. At Jesus' time, something that was happening was a lot like our time in the church. There was a mix of worldly, Hellenistic, Greek culture, and Jewish culture all in the same place. And so these purification rituals existed because of things that were talked about in the Bible. If you think about this, uh, one of the biggest examples I can give from the Old Testament is Naaman, the Assyrian general. When he came to Elisha to get rid of his leprosy, what did Elisha tell him to do? Does anyone remember? Wash himself in the Jordan seven times. And so these Pharisees created rituals of cleaning themselves to kind of come back. It was a way of bringing people back, being pure before God. They started with good intention like most tradition does, but they ended up letting their tradition overrule the practice of worship of God. But John is declaring here in this statement, John the Apostle, it's declaring in this statement, because we know at least by the time of the book of Acts, there were still people following the apostle, or the John the Baptist. John is declaring the baptism Jesus did was superior. He 
said, I will baptize you with water, but the one who comes after me will baptize you with fire and the Holy Spirit. Right? And but so that, Jesus, that would be after his uh, death, burial, and resurrection, right? John is, that day we're, 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 uh, we're going to get into that in a minute. Because John makes a statement right after this one. But John is declaring here. John does everything on purpose. Everything John writes, he has a purpose behind. He doesn't throw anything frivolous into here. There's no story about Jesus kicking back with his buddies and telling jokes. There is no purpose for this section other than to do one thing, which is to declare that Jesus' baptism is superior. Listen to this. John, okay, uh, so they came to him and they said, and everyone is flocking to this man you baptized, right? John responded, no one can receive a single thing unless it's given to him from heaven. You yourselves can testify that I said, I am not the Messiah, but I've been sent ahead of him. He who has the bride is the groom, but the groom's friend who stands by and listens for him rejoices greatly. At the groom's voice. Now, this is a Jewish custom that many may not understand, and I'm not going to get too deep into it. But it was custom during the wedding night for the best man to stand by the door and listen for the bride and the groom to make sure everything went okay. That's what John's talking about. You see, now, it's not trying to be vulgar or disgusting. The Jews, I mean, some of us get giggly like 12-year-old kids when we talk about the S word in church. But sex is something that God designed, and the symbol of them, the symbol of it, symbolism of it in the Bible is talking about one thing, oneness. It goes back to God's original intention for men and women. When you go back to Genesis 1.27, it said, For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. What John is declaring here is that God's plan and purpose is coming into fruition. That this was God's purpose all along. That this is what all the law and the prophets built up to was this moment. He didn't see the whole completion of it, but he knew it was coming. Does that make sense? And so the oneness that was severed in the Garden of Eden, and really, if you think about that, this is what John's calling us back to, the oneness that was severed in the Garden of Eden wasn't necessarily man and his wife, even though that was the very first thing that was broken. Think about it. The moment they ate the fruit, what did they do? They covered themselves up because they were naked. So that intimacy they had. They were the only two people in, their, in the world at that point. The intimacy they had was shattered. Next, that, the intimacy that was shattered was intimacy between God and man. Because they hid themselves from God. They first hid themselves from each other. Then they hid themselves from God. What John the Baptist is declaring right here is God is bringing back the intimacy. You see why the Bible talks about sex so much, especially when you get in the New Testament. It says abstain from sexual immorality. Why? Because God designed it for intimacy, and it hearkens us, if done in the context of a God-fearing message, to intimacy with himself. All human relationship is about that. If you think about this, I mean, I'm glad we got a little one here today. As a parent, I'm pretty sure y'all as grandparents... And, and as parents yourself, we can kind of get a glimpse of the grace <laughs> and God's love for us. Because no matter how many times we may say we want to kill our children, we never do. Why? Because we love them. And we want to see them succeed. And it doesn't matter how bad they get and all the things they do to hurt us and all the ways they break our heart, we still want to bring them back to ourselves, right? All human relationships, including human relations should draw us back to God. And that's what John is trying to teach his disciples right here when he's talking about who Jesus really is. This isn't about me. This is God coming back to restore everyone to himself. 
This is God's plan and purpose. And I don't even know if John really understood what he was saying at this point. Because at some point he questions if Jesus really is the Messiah. Well, I'm sure he did because in 31 he says that he's from the earth. But the one uh, that he speaks in the earthly way. That's not John the Baptist become, speaking. That's John the Apostle. Oh. Okay. Yeah, we'll get to that in just a minute. But listen to this, though. He says this. So, this joy of mine is complete. He must increase, but I must decrease. That's a heavy statement, isn't it? And that's the end of John the Baptist statement. We'll get to John the Apostle statement in just a second. Let's take a look at this. What does John mean when he says, he must increase and I must decrease? And what does this mean specifically for John? Not what does this mean for us? He, he took care of what he had to do. And he's he, supposed to pay it out. He had a purpose. He had a plan. But it's not about him. Well, he recognizes who Jesus is. Right. Right. He, he, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Right. He didn't know what that meant, but he said it. Ooh, I don't know. He didn't. Because let's think about this. Just a few chapters later, he sends some of his disciples to Jesus and says, Are you the one who we are expecting or should we look for someone else? He literally says that. Why? Because he was in prison. He wasn't seeing all the things that the rabbis had been teaching forever. And what were they teaching? Messiah was going to be this great military leader who was going to come in and put... Israel back in its proper place. That's never what the, the Old Testament said. It was what was being taught. It was what was popular. And John himself said that while he was in prison. This is before he was in prison. Tribulation always gets us to question things, doesn't it? <laughs> but here, John, just like you said, recognizes who Jesus is. He didn't understand what the Lamb of God meant. At least not at the time. He was looking for the restoration of the kingdom of Israel, not the kingdom of God. Most of them were looking for the restoration of Israel. They wanted Israel to be what it was supposed to be. John necessarily didn't want it to be what the rabbis were teaching, which was hell existed only for, or uh, the Gentiles only existed to fuel the fires of hell. That's what his, the rabbis were teaching. No, John wanted to see the true Israel, which has not yet come. There's going to be a new heaven and a new earth and a new Jerusalem at the center of it all. And God will be there and we will be with him always. That is the promise. But this was for the restoration of Israel, but also for the rest of the world. This idea of he must increase and I must decrease. John was simply saying that this is not my ministry. It's the ministry that God has given me. Now, how does this apply to us? Consider for a minute everywhere God places us. If we have them, our jobs. That is not ours. It is something that God has given us. Some of y'all are retired. <laughs> you know that you've seen things you've built with your bare hands passed on to someone else. Right? This world is not our home. All of it is temporary. This tent breaks down, and the older we get, we all face that reality. So this idea of he must increase and I must decrease, John is recognizing that this ministry is not his. It is God's. And when God pulls things into fruition, when God pulls things into completion, our part in it is done. There's going to be a, a day when we serve God continually before his face, always. But the ministry we do now is also coming to an end. Time is winding down. And I'm not calling this going to be in the next year or two or, or 30 or whatever. But since Jesus left, he's been returning. And some of us are going to hear that call before others do. We are constantly <coughs> faced with death on a daily basis. And so something this means for us, this he must increase and I must decrease, what this should mean for us is a difficult thing for a lot of us to grasp. My wants, wishes, and desires need, need to be put on the back burner. What should I be focused on if I'm following Christ? He must increase and I must decrease. What specifically, though, has he, has he charged me and you with? Not preaching. Going down the world publicly. Baptizing 
You talking about the Great Commission? The Gospel. Oh, the great, the great Commission. The Great Commandment. We are called to the Gospel. This is a profound statement, though. When you sit back and you think about that a little deeper, mm -hmm. he must increase and I must decrease. That is a deeply profound statement for all Christians. Absolutely. But see, most of us, and I say this in a general term when I always say us, and I like, to, I like including me in this because I've been guilty. We come to Christ for what we can get out of it. Does that make sense? There are whole churches built on what God can do for you. But when I come to Christ and I die and I'm crucified in the flesh, my life no longer means anything. When Peter walked into the house of Cornelius and they all began speaking in tongues, what statement did Peter make about God and individuals? Does anybody know? He says, now I know that God is not a respecter of persons. Meaning that God doesn't care about my comfort. God doesn't care about how I feel about things. God wants that all men should be restored to him. And why did Peter say that? Because as a good Jewish boy, he went into a Gentile's house, which was a cultural ta taboo. You did not go into a Gentile's house if you were a Jew. You'd be considered unclean and unfit for worship. You'd have to spend a specific amount of time being ritually clean after that. So it reminds me of when my boys were little and they're always questioning everything I said and answer and I answer them and I say, but what you think doesn't matter. <laughs> and I always use that excuse. What you think don't matter. And uh, you're just along for the ride, I tell them. And that's what we are. Right. What we think don't matter. Right. What we think it shouldn't be. And spiritually speaking, a lot of us are, are preteen teenagers in our attitude towards Christ. It's not fair. But I want to go here, God. This is what I want to do, God. God, this is what my life should be. It's not about this life. It's about going to him in the next. And it's about bringing as many people along with us as possible. I think you said this a couple weeks ago. It's impossible to go, ahead, go to heaven without taking somebody else. <laughs> Here's the thing. A lot of us, when we come to Jesus, we get like John's disciples. But God, why, why are our they seemingly doing better in the faith. Why is this new person who's come forward? And I've been coming to church for years. Why are they so on fire? Why are you talking to them more than you're talking to me? Why, why, why? We, we start throwing tantrums. Like ticked off teenagers. Or if we're younger. But John is showing us the attitude we all must take when concerning our Heavenly Father. It's not about me. It's all about him. Jesus alone is at the right hand of the Father. So Jesus alone gets to dictate the terms of my life. And I'll be honest with you, sometimes I'll drive around church on a Sunday and I'll see more cars out or seemingly, and I'll get a little bit jealous. But you know what? It's not about my popularity. I'm going to preach the word of God. I'm going to speak the truth. I'm going to continue the ministry he has given me because it's not about me. And during this time, when the rest of the world is in fear, I'm going to continue preaching hope. Because it doesn't matter what people say about me. They disagree with decisions that myself and the elders of the church have made. It's not about me. It's not about we recognize it. it's not about us. We are being obedient to the word of God and to what God has put on our hearts. We must decrease while he increases. And he has blessed our church this whole time. Maybe not the way we're used to. Maybe not the things that we like to see. But you know what? People have come to Christ. His kingdom has increased. Our message is going out all over town right now. 
actually start to reach quite a bit further. And I'm not talking about this to, to boost my ego. This is what the Lord is doing through our faithfulness here in Murfreesboro, Arkansas, at First Christian Church. When we are faithful to Him, He will be faithful to us. And it may not be what we want to see. It may not be what we desire. Because John's disciples, what did they want? They wanted a popular ministry. I mean, heck, John and Andrew went over that guy. You baptized him. He should be your disciple. I'll tell you something. I, I've been in ministry now since 2006. I started as a volunteer. And in 2011, I, I, I got into full-time ministry. One thing I've always heard people say, you baptize that kid. Now he's going over that church across town. Praise the Lord. He's still in church. <laughs> we brought him to Christ. And someone else is helping the completed, completion of the work. It's not about me. And so something I want to challenge all of us to do today, and I wanted to go through more today, uh, which we might be able to, is get uncomfortable for Christ. Share the gospel, even when it's not popular. Paul talks to Timothy in his farewell letter. Preach the word in season and out of it. What does that mean? When it's popular and when it's not. Go out and tell everybody you can about Jesus Christ. But nowadays, here's what happens. People want us to keep our faith in the church, and they don't even want us to do that because they're shutting churches down. And we've played the game for too long by their rules. You can't say it at your job. You can't say it at school. You can't say it at the park. I mean, there's states where people have been arrested for reading a Bible on a park bench. Philadelphia, it's happened. SWAT teams raided homes for having a personal Bible study. You see people have a party on the weekend? They're trying to shut down the church. That's the listen up bell. <laughs> and it's time we stop playing by the world's rules. We don't need to play nice with the world. And what I mean by that is we don't need to go out there and be belligerent, but we need to share the gospel no matter what the consequences. We need to share the gospel no matter what the consequences. We need to live our lives according to the gospel. The best way that we can share the gospel is first by living it so that when we do speak it, our actions and our words match up. My prayer is that all y'all who know me outside of church see the very same guy before this pulpit that you do everywhere else. I'm not just going to preach these words. I'm going to do everything I can to live them out. And that's why I confess that I'm a sinner to y'all on a weekly basis. Because I do need to confess that I'm a sinner. Because I don't have it all together. Because you don't follow Brian. But Brian follows Christ Jesus, who is faithful and just to forgive, as I confess. And you can follow him too. It's time for the church to get real uncomfortable. Right now, churches are meeting in secret. Did y'all know that? In the United States. Like it was Russian. People, churches are meeting in the United States and Canada, or in the United Kingdom and Canada, and all over Europe in secret. Because we've played nice with the world for too long, and the world still hates us. Jesus reminded his disciples if the world hated you, remember it, will, it hated me first. And if we follow Jesus, we either need to stake our claim with Jesus. And prepare to die on that hill for Jesus. Pick up our cross, like he said. Or go away. As someone once told me, put up or shut up. <laughs> and John the Baptist lived what he believed. He was there for God's purposes. His life was for God's purposes. And we find out later he got arrested because he said some things that made the ruler of the area very uncomfortable. <laughs> he got on that screen there. What does John mean when he says he must increase and I must decrease? Did we ever get to that bottom line? Exactly yeah. what he said. It's not about me. It's not about him. 
That's what he's saying. Why would he say that? Why, why would he say that it wasn't about him? Because it wasn't. Is there some recognition that he saw in Christ? or? Well, behold yeah. the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he who I told you about whose sandal I'm not fit to tie. Have I'd say there was read, recognition. I think he did it first. Have we, read, have we read on from 32 on? Not yet. 33? Okay, maybe we, we stopped. Maybe we can find out exactly what... But see, the what thing John is, you've got to understand is that that's not John the Baptist speaking. That's not John the Baptist. No, that's John the Apostle making a statement. Oh, really? Yeah. Huh. Right. So if you notice, the quotation marks in right at 30. Do what? The quotation marks in right at 30. Oh, really? Huh. I didn't know that. Yeah. So, let's get into that then. This is the statements that John the Apostle begins to make about Jesus. Listen to this, and I've got it on the board so you can kind of just see the different things he said. This is what John the Apostle okay, is good. saying. The one who comes from above is above all. And so who is that one? Right. Jesus Christ. He's declaring, again, this has to do with John's baptism versus Jesus' baptism. He's declaring that Jesus' baptism is superior. He is above all things. Everything Jesus did was superior. When he taught in the synagogue, how did Jesus teach that amazed the people? As with what? He taught as if he had authority. And none of the Bible teachers could teach that. But Jesus taught with authority. Why? Because he's the author of the book. So, the one who comes from above is above all. The one who is from the earth is earthly and speaks in earthly terms. Now, he's also thinking of something that John said. He's making a statement on John's statement. John was sent by God. He said that in John chapter 1. There was a man sent by God named John, right? So you look at the different contrast. The, the disciples of John were complaining and grumbling. But John was speaking of spiritual things, wasn't he? This is what he came to do. And so therefore he must increase and I must decrease. The one who comes from heaven is above all. He testifies to what he has seen and heard, yet no one accepts his testimony. The one who has accepted his testimony has affirmed that God is true. So, let's pause there for a minute. Jesus is from where? From above. He testifies to what? What he has seen and what he has heard. Everything Jesus said. He even told it to the Pharisees over and over. And we're going to find when he gets in fights with them. When they try and trip him up. He says, I can only show you what the Father is doing. When he heals the man on the Sabbath. I can only do what the Father has done. So Jesus is to, or John is declaring this of Jesus before Jesus really declares it. That he is the Holy One of God. He was sent by God. He is doing the work of God. And he has seen. And he testifies of what he has seen. And the one who has accepted his testimony has affirmed that God is true. I'm going to tell you all something. I know we've been talking about worldly versus godly. This is what he, he means here. The world is going to hate us. We don't need to make the church look like the rest of the world. We don't need to accept societal and cultural norms. We don't need to do that because the world has always been wicked and has always been in rebellion against God. Jesus Christ came and lived and taught and died because the world is in rebellion. As soon as you left the world and the church, it's no church at all. It's not. It's not true. Not, not when you invite the world in. Right. It ceases to be a church. And so we need to stand upon the word of God through Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. If we declare that Christ is true, we are going to be hated. There's going to come a time where you are going to have to put up or shut up when it comes to your faith. You are going to have to stand on what you believe and possibly die for or be tortured for what you believe. Doesn't it just confirm the fact 
that the Bible is so accurate and so true. You can, you can have a society that will praise a religion that will decapitate you, yet they hate Christians. Where we haven't murdered anybody in the past since the, uh, and I don't know, I would consider the, the Crusades a yeah. big the Crusades were a slow response. Right. I mean, and I, I get to that in it, but if you talk about the Crusades, and I always hate that. Yeah. The Crusades didn't start until 200 and some 70 odd years after the aggression of the Ottomans began. And it wasn't, it was just like society telling how bad yeah. Christians are today, just because of the. Well, the worldly church, the people, the right. worldly church, the counterfeit church, those who either are sanctimonious and think they're better than everybody else, or those with the name it and claim it persuasion that, that really pull people away from Christ. And if you think about it, it gives everybody who really truly follows Jesus a, a harder time because you've got these people who buy themselves $12 million mansions and airplanes and all this other stuff because they say they need it. That's what Satan does. He builds a counterfeit church that looks somewhat like the church should look. And if people cannot or people don't know the word of God, they're not going to recognize one from the other. That's the Corinthians were like that. Right. <laughs> See, chapter I, 4 speaks of what we're talking about right now. Absolutely. And it's why I always bring up the, the Treasury Department counterfeit bills. That's why I always tell people to read the word of God. Because you'll know what the church is supposed to look like if you read the word. And what a Christian is supposed to look like. Right. You know, I mean, church. Or well, yeah. I, I, would, I would contend that you can't have a Christian apart from the church. Yeah. Just like you can't have a Christian apart from Christ or a church apart from Christ. Now listen to this. Verse 34. For God has sent him, and he speaks God's words, since he gives the Spirit without measure. So there's some things there. He speaks God's words, he gives the Spirit without measure. Now, John is giving a foreshadowing of what Jesus is going to talk about. Jesus says, I must leave you at the Last Supper, but I'm going to send you a helper. And the Greek word literally means of the same kind as me. So Jesus, by declaring he was the Son of Man, declared himself to be equal, equal with God. And Jesus declared that the helper he would send us, the one who lives inside of us, the Spirit of God, is also in equality with God. Jesus is the one who gives us the Spirit. And the Spirit is our counselor, and He's our comforter, and He's our helper. So those are some of the here's the next thing. Let's see if I can actually don't get over here. Now, here we go. The Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hands. Later on, John would write a letter in which he says, God is love. Love existed from the beginning. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit have always been. Love has always existed, and we are an outpouring of that love. And if you love God, what does John say? Or if you love your brother, you, you what? You love who? Uh -huh. God. The one who believes in the Son has eternal life, but the one who refuses to believe in the Son will not see life. Instead, the wrath of God remains on him. You hear that? Refuses to believe. John is making, John the Apostle is making a statement. You're either going to accept God and take him at his word, or you're going to refuse to believe in him. Now, I'm going to say this. There are people who call themselves Christian who refuse to believe God's word. I say they call themselves Christian because they're not. Well, my, my Bible says, whoever does not obey, uh, obey, obey the Son. son. When, when they use the word believe, I mean, everybody believes, but well, not everybody obeys, right? The word so believe. the Christian person, the Christian obeys. He just doesn't just believe. The Greek, well, no, see, there's the problem. We've changed the definition of the word believe. To believe someone is to obey them. Right. Because even, even Satan believes. Even believe and shudder. 
Yeah. The demons, the demons know he exists, is what James is saying. Uh, no. Even the demons acknowledge him. Yeah, is what he's saying. They, yeah, they don't I believe, believe his They don't believe purpose. in him. They believe he is one. They believe him. I mean, they... Yeah, they no. believe he's one. And they have to subject themselves to him as we saw throughout his life. But here's what John is stating without a shadow of a doubt. You're either living a life for Christ or you're living a life in rebellion. There is no in-between. You cannot have God on your terms. You take it at Christ's term or you're in rebellion. Does that make sense? Yeah, you have to obey him. There is only two choices. There's the narrow path that leads to Christ or the wide way that leads to destruction. You cannot have God and. I had a discussion with someone and I just felt really just, I felt compassion for him. Because someone posts on this group I'm in on, on Facebook a chapter a day and they post that verse in Deuteronomy about sexual purity where it talks about sex with animals and homosexuality and all that other stuff. And, of course, people came out of the woodwork. Well, I can't believe that this is that thing. And some, studies, some Bible scholars have said X, Y, or Z. They searched for God on their terms. They were born that way. That's why the Bible, and I was trying to reason with them lovingly. That's why the Bible says you must be born again. Every single one of us in this world is born with some way, shape, or form an inclination towards rebellion. Some people are born towards homosexuality. Some people are born towards lying. Some people are born towards anger, murder. Some people are born towards uh, adultery, whether it's in their heads, in their hearts, or physical. All of us have a sin problem. And Jesus died for every single one. And therefore, we need to deny ourselves, pick up the cross, and follow him. We need to die to our sin. That's what John talks about through our sorry, John. Paul talks about in Romans and Galatians. We put to death the flesh, and therefore we're no longer under the law. But if we're still living in the flesh, we don't have Jesus. If we're still living in the flesh, we're still under the law. And if we're guilty of breaking one law, we're guilty of breaking them all. That's why it's a narrow path. Now, the awesome thing is God gives grace. When we stumble and when we fall, because all of us do, because John says in one of his letters... If anyone says he does not sin, that man is a liar. I love what you just said. I'm sitting here thinking about it. Because we've been fighting this social war forever. Mm -hmm. And their argument is they were physically born that way. We're all born that way. Mm -hmm. We're all born sinners. We're not, we don't have genetic makeup that makes us that way other than being a human. Right. But we're all born sinners. I, I like that answer. And I Separated think that's, from God. Separated from God. And that's what we have to stop doing is fighting against flesh and blood. Yeah. Because our enemy is not flesh and blood. John states, John Paul states that in Ephesians chapter 6. Uh -huh. Our enemy is not flesh and blood. A person who opposes my views on God and the Holy Spirit, a person who opposes the Bible is not my enemy. They are what I once was. But I'm not who I used to be. I am a new creation in Christ. What does Paul also write? If therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Behold, the old is gone, the new has come. And so we need to stop fighting. And this is what I end up telling the guy. I refuse to argue with him anymore. I said, I love you, and I love everybody else who you cannot believe the scripture for. And so I'm going to tell you the truth. Even if it means you hate me. I said, if I was a doctor and I knew you had cancer, it would be the most unloving thing in the world I could do mm. is to lie to you. Therefore, as a believer in Jesus Christ and one who stands upon the word of God, the most unloving thing I could do for you is to tell you a lie to make you feel better. We have to risk people hating us, but not in a combative way. What does Paul say to Timothy? Don't get caught up in useless arguments. But if you can, correct your opponents with gentleness that they may see. And he may not see. But there's a lot of other people who were involved in that conversation who saw what I said. And they saw that I wasn't being combative and unreasonable. I was standing upon the word of God. And I was dividing what it said. And there were people who came 
to a deeper understanding of God because I took a stance upon the scriptures. This person, when he was quoting all this stuff, was quoting outside sources. He wasn't quoting scripture. And when he quoted scripture, he was quoting it wrong to support his statement. We need to stand upon the word of God. And our lives need to support that. Not the other way around. There is only one way. There is only one truth. And there is only one life. And that is Jesus Christ. And so let us all stand upon his word. Let us take the same stance as John the Baptist. It's not about me. And I don't know about y'all, but following Jesus is pretty sticky. If you see nearly everybody in this book who's mentioned by name, with few exceptions, met a very, very difficult and sticky end. No health or wealth about what they had. I mean, some of them had wealth in their lives, and it wasn't a bad thing. But the majority of them gave everything up to follow Jesus Christ, including their own lives. You know, we have our kids, we have our grandkids, we have our neighbors, we have the people we see every day at the grocery store, we have our friends, we have our enemies. God has given them every single one of them to us for his purposes. And he must increase, and we must decrease. I think, you know, you said it is very profound. We need to stop fighting the social war. We need to start standing upon the word of God. And just like Paul says in Ephesians, just stand. We're not to advance. We're not to go tackle. We're not to fight. We're to stand upon the word of God. There's things we stand for. We stand for the sanctity of human life. We stand for the institutions that God has created. Marriage was the first. Well, that's just the word of God. Yeah. We stand on the word we of God. We stand upon it. You know, and I've told this to people since all this stuff began. I love you. But when God designed these things, and see, here's what we do, and what we don't realize. When we open those little doors, when we allow, or, or when, when we allow those doors to open just a little bit because we have love for, or compassion for somebody, we let all sorts of other things come through the gate. It's like Pandora's box. You know what I mean? Just one little creep and everything in the world popped out. We can't let anything creep in. We have to be vigilant. We have to be watchful in every facet of our lives. Brian, I read that verse wrong. What's that? Verse 36. Go for it. It does say, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son... Mm -hmm. Shall not see life. It speaks of rebellion. Yeah. And I'm going to tell you, and, and, and but believe is more than just acknowledge. Yeah. Right. It's more than just acknowledge. It yeah. is. I mean, Abraham believed God. That's the. If, if you want a thesis statement for the whole Bible, this verse is repeated throughout. Abraham believed God and was credited to him as righteousness. Abraham took God at His word. Before the law was ever written, before circumcision was the mark or the sign, before anything else, Abraham believed God. Paul quotes it, the author of Hebrews quotes it, Peter quotes it, it's throughout Scripture. So belief requires action. It's not merely a warm, fuzzy feeling or a thought. We need to stand upon the word of God. Stand upon it. Don't waver from it to the left or the right. Don't put your own ideas into it. James says, if any of you lacks wisdom, ask God who supplies generously. If you ask God, he is going to supply you with wisdom. And here's the most amazing thing about this book. I have now, I'm in my uh, practice of, this is the, the third year in a row I've read it all the way through uh, in a day, or uh, in a year. Every single time I read it, I find something new. This is living and breathing and active. As I grow, the Holy Spirit grows my understanding. You can stand upon the Word of God. Now, does anybody have anything else they'd like to say before we wrap up the night? I don't think we finished that last verse. We did. And I what, just, what exactly does that mean? You know, I've heard it said mean? that, that uh, oh, God loves everybody, but it says here, but the wrath of God remains on him. 
Do you want to? Do you want to? Remains hear? means abiding on him. It's an active word, right? Did you know that hell is the most loving thing God can do for someone? Yeah. But in the that, afterlife. But does God love everybody? Well, yes, He does. Now listen to this. I want you to hear this. Eternity is exactly what you ask for. Yeah. You either get Jesus because that's what you were seeking, or you get eternity away from Jesus because that's what you were seeking. But what does it mean? God doesn't like force God. God doesn't force anyone to come with him. No, I know that. But what does it mean? It means that they're going to live alone, suffering in outer darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. They're going to have a, a, a complete cut off. They're going to be completely cut off from the Spirit of God. Right now, the worst person in the world feels at least a sliver of the Spirit of God. The worst part about hell, I, I want you to hear this, Wes. The worst part about hell isn't going to be the lake of fire. It's going to be separation well, I, or eternity I from God. That. That's the torture. That's the wrath of God. God can do no greater punishment than that. But if you think about it, you get exactly what you asked for. The way I read it, but the wrath of God remains on him. That's in his present life. Am I wrong? Yeah. No, they're, they're speaking of eternity. Listen to what he says in the first... It's that context thing. Listen to it. Okay. The one who believes in the Son has eternal life, but the one who refuses to believe the Son will not see life. Instead, the wrath of God remains on him. When it talks about life, we, as believers in Christ, can have the, the taste of eternal life now. That's the peace of God. Everything the Spirit provides... The, the love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control that Galatians talks about. The, the, the Spirit produces in us fruit. But the one who does not believe or refuses to believe does not taste that fruit in this life or the next life. That's the wrath of God. In this life either, right? In this or the next. Because they refuse. It's the hardness of their hearts. And my book has a reference. It refers back to Mark 16, 16. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. Mm -hmm. And that's what it marks me. God gives, God gives us exactly what we seek at the end of it all. If we're seeking Christ, we gain Christ. If we're seeking ourselves, that's all we get. I think I'm going to make a study on that last part about but, but the wrath of God remains on him. I'm gonna... Here's where I would start. Mark 16, 16. Like, isn't that what you just read? Yes. Mark 16, 16. But here's what I would do, Wes, is when you study it, study the verses around it. Just don't... Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I want to read commentaries on it. I'll take but if, if you look at it, three but if, if, if you look at what John's literally yeah. saying, he talks about eternal life, and what he means by eternal life is talking about paradise, or eternity apart from Christ. Yeah, I know. You know, I, I, I'm not doubting you, but yeah. I've got to. I've got to have it settled in my own mind. I get it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. That being said, uh, would you mind praying for us so we can? Father, we thank you for this time that we can come together and uh, study your word. And we ask, Lord, that you reveal your scriptures to us, that we might know what you're saying to us. Lord, let us just not have knowledge, but let us have power. For Lord, uh, lots of people have knowledge of the Word of God, but that's all they have. But Lord, we ask to know your Word and to have that power. Yes. May you impart to us freely, Lord. Yes, you already have. You've given us your Holy Spirit. Lord, let us step out in faith and just believe you. Mm. That you've said that you've given to all those that believe your spirit. Without measure, we thank you, Lord. And let us hold on to your truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.